Tonight we have Dan Wood, Dr. Dan Wood. He, I asked him earlier today, I said, Dan, give me a biography so I can tell you some, tell the people something about you. And he said, tell them that I've been a, I'm a retired physician. I've been in this town for many years and I've been involved with the development of Maine's first ship for almost from the beginning. And I said, don't you wanna put more than that? He said, no, that's all they need to know. And so that's all you get to know. Dan, I welcome you to the podium. Well, unaccustomed as I am to public speaking, please <laughs> give me some break on this thing. But I do enjoy reviewing this history. And so when I was given the opportunity to do it, I said, yes, I'd love to. The, the others, I, yeah, but I'm told that the mic's okay. And I also, um, what was I gonna say? Uh, at any rate, um, I'm looking forward to sharing this story with you. And if you have any questions, certainly interrupt me and I'll be glad to be interrupted and talk about it. Okay, so the history of the Popham colony began uh, over a hundred years before it was actually founded in 1607. At least I'm starting it back then in 1497. Understanding the reasoning for uh, settling a colony in Maine on the Kennebec River in 1607, I think requires an understanding of some uh, somewhat of English history and the motivations of those times. Uh, <clears throat> Next picture. My clicker ain't working. This is, this is King Henry VII. Uh, in 1497, England was emerging from medieval times. It was a small country on the outer edge of Northwest Europe and was not a major power like the kingdoms of Spain or France were at the time. The turbulent years of the War of the Roses ended 12 years before in 1485 when Richard III was defeated and killed. And his uh, victor, the victor in this was Henry Tudor, who became Henry VII. English fishermen from the west of England had fished for years in the Atlantic Ocean west of England, but they had no idea how far westward that ocean stretched um, and what, if anything, might be over there. They were not aware that 500 years earlier, Vikings had found and settled briefly in Vineland, a land which later took the name Newfoundland. In 1497, merchants of Bristol, England, located on the west coast of England, received Henry VII's permission to hire an Italian named John Cabot to carry out an exploration of the Western Ocean. Their primary interest was to make money by trading with Asia. And he was searching for a Northwest Passage to Asia. Cabot was probably born in Genoa, Italy. He was of an age, uh, it was at, at a time when it probably is not unlikely that he knew a young fellow in uh, Genoa by the name of Christopher Columbus, who was growing up at the same time. He certainly was aware of Columbus's journey to the islands of the Indies in 1492. And he too was hoping to find a way to the riches of Asia. In May of 1497, Cabot sailed from Bristol, England, uh, 3,000 miles west with a crew of 18 and a 78 foot long ship called the Matthew. And in late June, he found land which he claimed for England. At that time, he believed he had landed in the northeast coast of Asia. And of course, he, he, he uh, had not. Uh, but of more importance at that time was his discovery of, of uh, fishing ground southeast of Newfoundland, begin uh, teeming with cod and other fish. We call that the Grand Banks. Buoyed by this success, when he got back, Cabot sought and received support of Henry VII for a second exploratory voyage. With five ships, he departed Bristol in May of 1498, planning to to quote him, to keep along the coast from the place where I had landed before, Newfoundland, and more and more go east until he reaches an island which he called Chipango, which sounds like Japan to me, where he thought all the spices of the world had their origin. 
One of the ships developed problems and returned, but the other four continued and were never heard of again. Presumably they made it to Newfoundland and proceeded northwest toward the Labrador Sea. Um, you can see Greenland and the Labrador Sea and a little bit up in the far left is Baffin Island. And all these areas were choked with, with ice at the time, sometimes year round. So Cabot's initial successful voyage led to many men and ships navigating the, their way back and forth across the North Atlantic. Through the 1500s and well into the 1600s, they tried to map, explore, and understand what this land mass we now call North America, what it consisted of. The bountiful fishing grounds were from the start a major attraction. European and English fishing ships led the way. In relatively small ships, these men would spend about two months making their way westward to the fishing grounds off of Newfoundland. Nova Scotia and Maine. After a number of weeks fishing and processing their catch, they would return home. The trip going, the westward trip, took two months because they could not sail directly into the prevailing westerly winds. Um, they would travel 1,400 miles southwest to the Azores, which I'm trying to point out. Oh, really? Okay. Didn't know that. Oh, yes. Okay. And, um, <clears throat> and then they would turn northwest from there and go up to uh, Greenland, which is right here, uh, and into the Grand Banks. <clears throat> they would spend about a month and then typically return. It would only take about a month to get back uh, because of the prevailing westerly winds. But overall, it was a four or five months uh, duration. The motivations for Europeans navigating the Atlantic were several. Initially, both Columbus and Cabot were intent on finding a shorter way to Asia. Since the time of the Romans, Europeans and Romans, maybe Greeks, had become very fond of luxury goods from Asia. This included silk, gems, and various spices. In the 13th century, Marco Polo visited and wrote extensively about the abundance of riches in the Far East. For 1500 years or more, the only way to attain these luxuries required overland passage on the Silk Road, passing through Muslim controlled territory. To bypass this obstruction and make more money, alternative routes to Asia were sought. This is Prince Henry the Navigator. By 1420, Prince Henry the Navigator of Portugal was spurring Portuguese exploration of the Atlantic. He had established a center for exploration and mapping in Portugal near Lisbon. As a result, the Portuguese became leaders in the exploration and navigation of the Atlantic Ocean. In 1434, these efforts resulted in the discovery of the Azores, 900 miles uh, west of Portugal. And they were, again, a typical sort of spot that if you're going down from England, you go to the Azores and then back up to Newfoundland or to Maine. Uh, the, the Portuguese navigator Vasco da Gama tried going east around Africa via the Cape of Good Hope to get to Asia. He left Lisbon in 1497, made it to Calcutta, India the next year and returned to Portugal the next year after that. Map makers predicted that Asia was much closer to Europe because they did not understand the width or realize the width of the Pacific Ocean. Both Columbus and Cabot believed these map makers, hence their feeling that they were getting pretty close once they got across the Atlantic Ocean. And the idea of getting through to Asia via North America was in the, idea of, in the minds of explorers and navigators for uh, over a hundred years really up until the time of the Popham Colony settlement. Another way to get over there was to go around the world. And this Magellan did in 1519, although it took three years and most of his ships sank and most of his sailors, including himself, died along the way. Finally, some people thought maybe you could go there by going north and uh, east. Uh, that that might be the quick way to go. They would go up or over and around Norway 
and across Northern Europe, but they inevitably were stopped by ice. Uh, in fact, uh, Henry Hudson, um, who was working actually uh, under contract for the Dutch, uh, tried to get up through there three times and failed each time. So finally he headed west like everybody else was doing. He did not make it to Asia as we know, but he did discover uh, New York Harbor and the Hudson River in 1609. Verrazano uh, was a, uh, another advocate of sailing west. Uh, he was a, a native of Florence, Italy, but developed his skills as a mariner and navigator working outside of Normandy, France. And in 1524, he set out under the uh, support of Francois Premier, King of France, who was a cousin of Henry VIII. Uh, the King offered his support and permission to explore for France and the bankers of Lyon, France, a center for French silk industry provided the funding. Of course, the bankers hoped they would make it to uh, get Asian silk and make a lot of money. Financial reason return was the major reason why most of these ex explorations uh, took place. So in January of 1524, Verrazano with 50 men set sail on his ship, La Dauphine, quote, on a voyage for the Indies, unquote, that's quoting him. From Normandy, France, he sailed down to Madeira off the coast of Morocco and traveled due west and uh, arrived at the coast of North America at the latitude of Cape Fear. down here uh, in March off North Carolina. From there, he, uh, he started sailing north. He came along, immediately came upon the outer banks of North Carolina. We know about Cape Hatteras and Kitty Hawk. And um, as he's going along there, he, uh, they're about 30 miles off the coast. And as he's, he, from his perspective, even up on top of the mast, he could not see any land beyond them. And he figured he was looking at the Pacific Ocean. It was really Pemlico Bay, but he thought it was the Pacific Ocean. And uh, he did not try to get through the, to go on. He thought he discovered the way. And then he kept going north. Um, he, his conclusion was that the, interestingly, that North America continent had a very narrow waist, you know, only these small banks. And, and that's kind of odd, but that's what he thought. This, this notion was actually written down on a globe that was created by his brother just about 10 years after this voyage. That uh, uh, So people bought the story at that point. Verrazano continued to cruise up the coast, and whenever he stopped and sent a boat ashore, they were met by friendly and pleasant people. At one point, a member of his crew fell out of the shallop and nearly drowned. The Indians saved him, warmed him, warmed the young man up and helped him get back to the ship. Uh, you, he stayed so far offshore most of the time that he missed the entrance of Chesapeake and Delaware Bay, but he did not miss the entrance for New York Harbor. So on April 15th of that year, 1524, he anchored inside what we today call Verrazano Narrows. And of course, there's a big bridge going across that at this time. Uh, he anchored there, he took a smaller boat, traveled north up into New York's upper bay. And again, was surrounded by interested, pleasant, happy people, uh, which was, he loved it. He was very impressed. But he continued to, to go along uh, across, outside of Long Island as he, um, as he came around, he passed this little island here, which reminded him of an island that he had seen in the Aegean, Rhodes. And so the name Rhode Island presumably comes from that mistake that he made. Today, we call that Block Island. But at, at that point, he picks up uh, Indians who came out in their canoe, and one of them helped him steer into the port of Newport. And he stayed there for two weeks and enjoyed meeting and trading and getting to know, know the people there. Uh, <clears throat> so he spent two weeks enjoying a warm relationship with the local Bampanag Indians. From there on May 6th, they sailed through Vineyard Sound. Uh, it was Martha's Vineyard, uh, Nantucket around Cape Cod. 
and headed sort of northeast, northwest, and came to the coast of Maine, somewhere in Casco Bay. In fact, we think it was Small Point. Uh, on the Maine coast, they encountered. On the Maine coast, they encountered Abnaki Indians who were not nearly so pleasant as the Wampanoags. They're, and I'm quoting him, crudity, quote unquote, and quote, evil manners, quote unquote, prevented easy interaction and trading. At one point, the Indians conceded to trade and they did so from a rocky cliff, letting down a basket on a line to his shallop below. The latitude of this interaction was 44 degrees, 40 minutes north, which is probably bald head on the tip of small point. At least so thought Professor Samuel Elliott Morrison and in his book, The European Discovery of North America. At parting, the Indians used, and then to quote Verrazano, quote, all signs of discourtesy and disdain as was possible for any brute creature to invent, such as exhibiting their bare behinds and laughing immoderately, end of quote. It, perhaps this behavior prior, uh, belies prior unpleasant interaction with other European mariners and fishermen. In any case, Arizona labeled Maine here, quote, the land of bad people, quote, quote. He didn't see, I guess, the Kennebec River, uh, but the behavior that he encountered, of course, it was what, 90 years, 80 years later that the Popham colony was founded, but still getting to be getting along with Indians was a real problem for the Popham colony. He, uh, <clears throat> he, he finally got up back to Newfoundland and headed back to France uh, from there. Uh, the next uh, French explorer to follow Verrazano in searching North America for a way to Asia uh, and along to evaluate the territory itself was Jacques Cartier. He was financially supported again by the King of France, and he made three voyages in the 1534 to 1542. He was financially supported by the King. He explored and named St. Lawrence River, and he came up with the name Canada using an Indian name for the region. His, uh, his voyages led to a much greater understanding of the geography of the future Canada up the St. Lawrence River as far as the current site of Montreal. His explorations to find a route to Asia was blocked by a series of rapids uh, close to where, we, where Montreal is today. And he named those rapids the China Rapids. So you can assume he thought that was the way to go. Um, these uh, explorations did not have a direct effect on setting the stage for colonization and North Virginia, which is what the Popham Colony was, the site of the Popham Colony. However, the theme of searching for a way west to Asia, for trading with Indians for economic advantage, for finding natural resources of value, for claiming for national sovereignty, a part of this new world were all motivations for these explorations. And the Popham Colony uh, effort had the same goals 70 years later. And it is important to note that Cartier often bumped into French, Portuguese, and Spanish fishermen who were already taking advantage of the newly discovered fishing grounds that he had explored. They were there for the fish, but not for exploration and drawing maps. They did, however, interact and influence the local Indians. And I, this wasn't part of my talk, but I read someplace where um, in the late 1500s, uh, English uh, sailors bumped into a group of Indians who were from Nova Scotia. And they were, they were sailing in a shallop, a sailing shallop they'd gotten from Basque fishermen. And they were wearing you know, European clothing. So uh, there was an amazing interchange prior to 1600. Um, this is the, uh, uh, the, the Pope, Alex, Pope Alexander, the the uh, sixth in 1496, I think, uh, supported or got involved in developing the Treaty of Tordesillas, which divided the then known, and that means then known, undeveloped world, world between Spain and Portugal. Basically, he used a longitudinal line. Um, 
the Portuguese at the time, at that time, Spain and Portugal were the major European powers exploring and seeking sovereignty. And the treaty gave the right to colonize Asia and Africa to Portugal and North and South America to Spain. It did allow Portugal to have Brazil. In 1532, Pope Clement VII clarified the treaty, stating that it applied only to lands that had already been discovered at that time. So for lands that not discovered in 1494, i.e. North America, the coast was clear for France and England to explore and colonize there. Henry VIII had very little interest in the exploration of the New World. You know, he was, I can't remember exactly the years, but like 1525 to 1545 or something like that. Actually, earlier than that. Uh, he did not have interest despite a letter. Uh, I took, this is a painting at the Victoria and Albert Museum, which I took the other, a month ago, Linda and I were walking through the Victoria and Albert, so I took that picture. I thought it was a kind of an unusual view of, of Henry in this. But at any rate, uh, he received in 1527, a Robert Thorne, a, a, print, a, a Bristol, England businessman wrote, quote, God in nature so provided to your grace, this realm of England and set it so fruitfully a place as to be free from foreign conquest, that it is compassed with the sea. And then he said, after saying that Spain and Portugal had already taken their share in the West and South, quote, now the rest to be discovered, the said North parts, which seems to me is your charge and duty. So it's interesting that somebody was telling Henry VIII to get to it, but he didn't do it. This is Richard Hacklute. Uh, in the last half of the 1500s, England had the advantage of Richard Hacklute pushing English exploration and navigation. He was born in England in 1553. He became a clergyman who was tirelessly promoted English colonization of the New World. He gathered various reports and writings from Spain, Portugal, France, on anything of interest and relevance to navigation and exploration of the world. He had this information translated into English published and promoted to royalty, mariners, merchants, businessmen, and other adventurers. France didn't have such a promoter. And I think that explains the difference uh, and why. I, I, I lay a lot of the responsibility of England's success at taking over North America, as it were, to um, uh, Mr. Hecklew. While a young student, this is Mr. Hecklew, uh, at the Westminster School, in the 1560s in London, he would visit his cousin and guardian, who was also named Richard Hecklew, who was a barrister working in the Middle Temple of London. <clears throat> the Middle Temple is one of the four places in London where you can learn to be a barrister and speak before the court, as opposed to just a solicitor lawyer who can only kind of make suits and stuff like that. Hecklew himself says, and to quote him, I do remember that being a youth and one of Her Majesty's scholars at Westminster, that fruitful nursery, it was my hap, H-A-P-P-E, which I think means luck, but it was my hap to visit the chamber of Mr. Richard Hackloot, my cousin, a, a gentleman of the Middle Temple, when I found lying open on his desk certain books of cosmology and a universal map. So I was in some estate in England in their library and saw these books of cosmology. So that's the word he used. And basically it's geography uh, of the world. Uh, my cousin seeing me somewhat curious in view of therefore began to instruct my ignorance by showing me the division of the earth into the three parts after an old account. And this is a world map that, that Hackler would have used uh, by Wright Molyneux. And it's over at the, it's in a globe form at the Middle Temple. <coughs> Here's one of his books, Principal Navigations, Voyages and Discoveries of the English Nation Made by Sea and Over Land. Although interestingly, his first book was diverse. And you know, so they, they, it's fun to read this stuff, you know, because it's not the way we, speak these days, but you can certainly understand it. 
his first book was Diverse Voyages Touching the Discovery of America and the Islands Adjacent. And that was published in 1582. Working with Sir Walter Raleigh and others, he promoted English dominance of the seas, advancing navigational technology, colonization in North America. And in 1606, he was the chief promoter of a petition to James I for a letter of patent to colonize Virginia, i.e. North America, that was the word they used then, to colonize Virginia, which, which was granted to, the Lon to London and Plymouth branches of the Virginia Company. But the point was in 1606, the Virginia Company was formed and it had these two branches, a Plymouth and a London branch. It was the Plymouth branch that sponsored the settlement at the Popham Colony. Another important personage in these days was John Dee. He, uh, he was a mathematician born in 1527 and Queen Elizabeth called him my philosopher. And although he had some oddball ideas about astrology and stuff like that, he did, he was interested in the, in the mathematics of navigation and wrote this book uh, in 1577 entitled, quote, The Perfect Art of Navigation. So along with Hakluyt, he promoted English exploration and perfected the art of navigation. And he actually coined the term British Empire. <clears throat> The English navigators and adventurers um, really got started searching for a way to Asia in the last third of the 16th century. Elizabeth became queen in 1558. Her, her common sense and ambition resulted in a golden age for England. And here I quote from Margaret Wilson, who was here last year and gave a talk and has written a really good book called Norumbega Navigators, which is all about what I'm doing now. And I hope to get her book available in the near future. I'm working with her. But anyway, here she, she writes, more than any other European prince, the queen, she encouraged with her patronage and, uh, and support from her privy purse, the overseas voyages of her subjects. Her Protestantism enhanced the security and isolation, the insecurity and isolation of her realm, but it stimulated national pride. Englishmen now felt a spiritual urge to adventure and expansion. It was their duty to see that the American savages got the gospel straight and pure, and that Protestant colonies were planted in the new world, unquote. That's Margaret. Many of the men who became important navigators and mariners were encouraged by the queen. She invested considerable funds in some of their voyages. This is a map of the West Country of England. I think you can I presume you understand this is sort of the left lower, the Southwest corner. And uh, the four um, um, core counties of Dorset, Somerset, Devon, and Cornwall encompass this area. And it was these areas that most of the navigators that we think are and remember like Sir Walter Raleigh, um, Francis Drake, uh, came from um, Humphrey Davy. Hum well, uh, at any rate, uh, it was a. It was maybe because they were involved with the fishermen and exploring to begin with. This was really the focal point for for men who were interested in developing um, North America. And I think it's interesting to look at some of the towns: Falmouth, Plymouth, Dartmouth, Topsham, and Exeter. You know. It's, Dartmouth was a major port. Topson was an important port. Uh, in between Exeter and Plymouth is the Dart Moors. I don't know, do you know the Moors? They're high, uh, un, unforested, rock covered, but beautiful places to walk and hike. And the, the Dart drains down toward, uh, from the Dart Moors into Dartmouth and enters the uh, um, <clears throat> English Channel there. For the first 70 years of the 16th century, English and French exploration of North America and the Northwest pa Passage was generally inactive. Most of the ships crossing across the Atlantic were fishermen who did not draw maps or make drawings. There was one interesting exception, and this was a guy by the name of 
Woe Alvarez Fagundes. He was a Portuguese fisherman and navigator who recruited his family from Portugal and uh, from other from the Azores to settle in what is now Inganish, Nova Scotia, a protected harbor on the east coast of Cape Breton. And you see Inganish up there, and this is all of Nova Scotia. He did this starting in 1521, and they only lasted a year or two. Uh, from Nova Scotia, Fagundes sailed down the coast, discovered the Bay of Fundy. You can see how he could have done that. And he thought he had made it, in, and it is thought he made it into Penobscot Bay after meeting with local Abnaki Indians. He learned about a place up the Penobscot River that they called Norumbega. And again, this is 1521 22. Although Fagundes' colony only lasted a little more than a year, and although he never visited it, the idea of this, of this sort of central town, village of Indians called Norumbega stuck. In fact, a few years later, I, I mentioned this is before Verrazano. And so Verrazano was 1524, this is 1521. But uh, five or so years later, Verrazano's um, brother makes a, a, a world globe and it shows Norumbega on it. So he obviously heard about this thing uh, being there. Um, so the remarkable story of um, David, Ing and by the way, Norm Bega is probably up where we think uh, Bangor is today. In fact, the, the word itself is an Indian mean, uh, word meaning, quote, a stretch of calm water between two rapids. So the remarkable story of David Ingram, Ingram, led to the Norumbega becoming a place of gold and other riches in the minds of many Englishmen. Ingram had been marooned on the west coast of Florida in 1567 by Captain John Hawkins. Probably he was mutinying and this was disciplinary, marooning him on this far off place. But, but this guy, David Ingram managed to walk on Indian trails all the way up to Maine where he finally hailed a French fishing ship, which returned him to England. And once in England, he, re he would make money by regaling stories at pubs. And the big story he liked to tell was about Norumbega. And he made it sound like, they were, like the Spanish were finding down in Spain, or rather in, in Central America, gold, pearls, silver, anything you might want. And it, it, it read to the, led to this idea of Norumbega being a place to to find. The whole idea, the uh, whole area took on the name of Norumbega until 1585, when Sir Walter Raleigh changed the name of the entire North American coast, extending from Georgia up through Maine to calling it Virginia after the Virgin Queen, Queen uh, Elizabeth. He changed the name after he had been given a patent by the Queen to settle and control the area. This is a little closer up and you can kind of figure, see how Norum Bay is up the Penobscot River there. Um, so when the Popham colony was planned in 1606, the riches of Norum Bay were probably still in the thoughts of Sir John Popham and Fernando Gorges, the two men most responsible for developing the, the colony. Even though in 1604, Samuel de Champlain had sailed up the Penobscot and reported there ain't no Norm Beg up there that I can see, you know, so he, but I don't know whether that word got out to uh, the English guys. This is Martin Frobisher. The search for a shortcut to Asia, Northwest Passage continued with Martin Frobisher's three voyages between 1576 and 1578. These were sponsored by the quote, Cathay Company. Remember I talked about the Virginia Company and the Cathay Company was a joint stock corporation organized to finance the exploration, just as the Virginia company was 20 years later, uh, or 30 years later. Um, Martin Frobisher was of course not successful, but he exemplified great courage as he and his men battled ice while exploring the Southern part of Baffin Island, looking for the Northwest Passage. I like this picture with his gun and stuff like that. Uh, Sir Francis Drake, most of us have heard of Francis Drake. He uh, was born in Stab Tavistock in the shadow of the Dartmoors. 
of, in Devon, and he circumnavigated the world between 1577 and 1580 with the knowledge and support of the queen. As he sailed up the West Coast, I think he missed San Francisco Bay, um, but as he sailed up, he was so seeking the Western outlet of the Northwest Passage, but that of course eluded him as well. And this is Sir Humphrey Gilbert. The settlement of the English colonies in North America did not begin until the last quarter of the 1500s. The first attempt was that of Sir Humphrey Gilbert, whose son Raleigh Gilbert was the second in command of the Popham colony. Sir Humphrey hailed from the West Country in Devon. He was born in 1539 along the River Dart, close to Exeter. And the Dart River originates, I had already told you this stuff. Dartmouth was a major English port and his ancestral home was Compton Cabin, Ca Compton Castle, which was near the River Dart and to which Raleigh Gilbert returned when he left Fort St. George in Maine in 1608. And you can see where Compton Castle is there, uh, kind of along the Dart River. You see Tavistock on the other side? That's where, um, who did I say it was? Oh, oh um, yeah. Anyway, um, it's a wonderful place. Linda and I have been there. We've hiked up in these mountains and or hills. It's really a lot of fun. So during the reign of bloody Queen Mary, uh, Gilbert found a place in the court of Princess Elizabeth. He continued to be a frequent court visitor and a friend of Elizabeth after she became queen. In 1566, he argued in her court to support searching for the Northwest Passage, quote, to go to Cathay and all other East parts of the world, close quote. And he then wrote a book the same year a discourse on the discovery of a new passage to Cathay. And in 1578, Gilbert was given a letter of patent by Queen Elizabeth. She considered him, quote, my well-beloved servant, quote, close quote. And the, the permission was, the patent was, quote, to discover, search, find out, and view such re remote heathen and barbarous lands, countries, and territories not actually possessed of a Christian prince or people, end of quote. His intent was to start a colony in Norumbega. This document guaranteed to all Englishmen that the descendants who might inhabit the American colony, the rights and privileges of Englishmen, quote, as if they were born and personally resided within our realm of England, close quote. Interesting wording, and certainly these points were still being debated but in the 13 colonies as late as 1776. So Gilbert planned this voyage in 1578, but he never got off the ground. He didn't have a lot of money and he had to get a lot of friends to support him. He wasn't ready to leave until 1582. The first time the queen did not want him to go. At first, the queen did not want him to go. She worried he was quote, a man of not good hap with a C. Remember hap, <laughs> luck? He was a man of not good hap with the sea, she thought. He reassured her and she relented and sending him as a memento, a piece of jewelry showing an anchor guided by a lady. I think she was a little smitten by the guy actually. So as she was by Walter Raleigh, you know. So in June, 1583, his fleet left England, left Plymouth. The fleet consisted of five ships. The, the chief ship was the Delight, 120 tons. There was a bark, the Raleigh, 200 tons, the Golden Hind, 40 tons, the, Sw the Swallow, 40 tons, and a pinnace, the Squirrel, 10 tons. Now, remember the Virginia, when it was built back in 1607, eight, was 30 tons. So this pinnace was pretty small, but that was part of the, float the fleet, the Squirrel. Uh, on board, these ships were 260 men including carpenters and masons. So he was serious to, to build a colony. For unknown reasons, the bark Raleigh, two days out, turned around. But the remaining four ships 
arrived in Newfoundland by July 30th. It took almost two months. On August 3rd, Gilbert's fleet entered St. John's Harbor on the east coast of Newfoundland. This is a picture I took a couple of years ago showing the inlet. You know, there's the harbor and there's the inlet with these mountains on either side of it. It's a lovely harbor. There were um, Gilbert on the flagship delight entered through the harbor's narrow entrance and struck a rock. There were 36 ships or fishing boats from Portugal, Spain, France, and England anchored in the harbor. And many of them sent out longboats to help free the delight. That day, August 3rd, 1583, Gilbert claimed possession of Newfoundland for England and with apparently no objection from the resident fishermen. Nobody remembered that John Cabot had done the same thing in 1497. Uh, this might be considered the birth of the British Empire, the first sort of land outside of the British Isles that uh, they claimed. After a pleasant two weeks of socializing in the harbor at St. John's, Gilbert's fleet started south to find a location for their colony, Norumbega. For some reason, the Swallow, one of the ships was sent home. So the remaining three ships left St. John on August 20th. Gilbert elected to sail in the pinnace, 10 tons, Squirrel, as quote, and to quote him, the most convenient to discover upon the coast and to search into every harbor and creek, which a great ship could not do, close quote. That's, that's uh, Humphrey Gilbert's statement. The first objective as they traveled south was Sable Island off the southeast coast of, of uh, Nova, Nova Scotia. You can see that going from St. John's, he goes down to the uh, Sable Islands. Um, the reason they wanted to stop off there was Portuguese had left pigs and cattle there over years and they were breeding. So he could stop there and get a supply of food to keep his colony well fed for the upcoming winter in Norumbega. Unfortunately, on August 29th, his main ship, the Delight, struck hard and fast on the fabled, on the fabled shoals surrounding Cable Island, Sable Island, and the ship was lost. 85 men were drowned, and all of the books and supplies, et cetera, et cetera, were gone. So the colonization uh, would clearly be impossible. Only the Golden Hind and the Squirrel were left. So as they returned to England, Gilbert insisted on staying on the Squirrel, despite the pleas of his men. Quote, this is what Humphrey says, I will not forsake my little company going homeward, he says. So they, they take the, the route down toward the Azores to go back. And when they get down to the Azores and are heading up, they suddenly come into a big storm and high seas. St. Elmo's fire uh, blazed ominously from the main yard um, of the uh, swallow, of the golden hind, excuse me. Um, on the afternoon of September 9th, the ships were sailing close to each other and Gilbert was seen by the captain, Captain Hayes of the Golden Hinds. Gilbert was seen and described as, quote, sitting abaft with a book in his hand. And he cried out unto us in the Golden Hind. He said, this is quoting uh, Gilbert Humphrey, Humphrey Gilbert, quote, sitting abaft, oh, we are as near to heaven by sea as by land. That's what he said. Uh, that night around 12 o'clock, or not long after, and now I'm again quoting the Captain Hayes of the uh, Golden Hind. That night, about 12 of, 12 of the clock, or not long after, the frigate being ahead of us, he called it a frigate, not a pinnace, the frigate being ahead of us in, in the Golden Hind, suddenly her lights were out, whereof it were in a moment we lost the sight and all our watch cried. The squirrel and, and Sir Humphrey, Gilbert Humphrey, had been swallowed by the sea. And he wasn't half, just as, as the queen had said. The Golden Hind got to Dartmouth uh, by September 22nd, and the queen was informed of, uh, of the poor result for, uh, for Sir uh, Humphrey Gilbert. He had been a tireless force promoting English exploration 
and settlement in the wor new world. Clearly an optimist and somewhat of a romantist, I think. But the wreck of the delight on Sable Island, Maine's first colony, but for that wreck on Sable Island, Maine's first colony might have been established on an island in Penobscot Bay by Sir Humphrey. So that's my story for part one. Thank <laughs> you.